Until now, we've been considering linear relationships in this regression framework. And of course, we know that um, life is non-linear um, and linearity can be quite a strong restriction. Hence, we're going to um, explore the opportunity of having some non-linearity in our models here. Um, the most obvious and most very commonly used uh, nonlinearities to actually um, use a, an alternative functional form for a regression model. The way an alternative functional form is achieved is by taking, uh, for example, logs of your um, y variable and logs of your predictor, and then you have a log-log functional form. Um, if you take this type of functional form, then your Vita1 coefficient, your estimated coefficient for this uh, is no longer a marginal effect, but you can interpret this as an elasticity. Hence, it's the average percentage change in Y resulting from a 1% increase in X. A couple of more comments worth making here. You can have alternative specifications where you may just want to log your Y variable or you just more, may want to log your X variables. And then, of course, this Vita1 coefficient has different interpretations. Um, some of your data will have may have um, uh, zero values and hence you cannot take a log transformation. To actually overcome that, you can take, um, uh, you can add one to your Xs, making everything non-zero and then take the log, transform log transformation. And uh, that's a good trick of actually um, um, of overcoming the restriction of having zeros and also log of one where a zero exists is equal to zero. So it sort of maintains those zeros in the data. If a log transformation is not good enough and we want to see a little bit more flexibility, we can actually think about having um, nonlinear function for our x's. Um, a commonly used nonlinear function would be to have a piecewise linear function. So the way you specify this is um, you let uh, a new variable x1 equal to x, and then you specify a new variable x2, which is based on x, um, but it takes the value 0 if x is below some threshold c, and it takes the value x minus c if x is above this uh, uh, C and C is the point where your um, trend is actually it forces the trend to bend at that point. More general, if you wanted more of these uh, bends, uh, this is uh, uh, a general uh, example of a linear regression splines where now we have um, C to C k minus one knots. So we have we put the knots and the bends happen in those places. Um, Good in theory and nice to implement. However, there are challenges. Uh, identifying where the knots should be placed is quite difficult and sometimes it's arbitrarily chosen. Um, automatic selection algorithms uh, are very slow, so there's no sort of easy solution to this. Um, you can use higher order polynomials. For example, you can use uh, piecewise cubics and they will achieve a smoother result. So instead of having a, a bend, you, you have sorry, uh, sorry, a, a, a linear that breaks at that point, you have a smooth uh, curve that goes through. Now, a warning should be made that, you know, uh, with anything nonlinear, especially if you're extrapolating outside the range of historical data, um, that nonlinearity causes uh, uh, may cause a lot of troubles and that type of model can be uh, produce very unreliable forecasts, especially when we're going outside those um, uh, the ranges of the historical data. So uh, within the historical data, we'll get a better fit, but when we extrapolate, we may be in trouble. So if you're going to use something like this, use it with very, very, uh, very, very cautiously. Now let's have a look at an example of using a piecewise um a piecewise linear regression, but in this case, we're going to consider our X variable being the trend. So we're going to consider uh, a piecewise linear trend. So um, our X variable is T, hence it remains as T. Now we specify a new variable XT2, which takes the value zero when T is less than TAF. TAF is some point in time where we think um, the we want to put a bend where the break has happened, where the change in, in slope has happened. And xt2 takes the value of t minus tough when t is greater than tough. So let's have a look at this diagrammatically. So here's a sort of um, 
a time series uh, where um, we can clearly see, you know, I've exaggerated the point here, we can see uh, a, a break in the slope, a break in the trend at time tough. So if we want to use a piecewise linear trend, um, we're going to specify the variables like this. And when we fit them, what do we get? We get basically, uh, we estimate two slopes. The first slope, Vita1, is for the first part of the sample. So from t equals 1 to tough. And then um, the new uh, slope is is equal to Vita1 plus Vita2, which is estimated for uh, past uh, point tough. Okay, so this is uh, what they show. Now, alternative to that, we can use quadratic or higher order trends, but this comes back to the warning that we said before that uh, with our variable t, our sample is is uh, um, observed from time equals one to capital T. Once we go outside that range, extrapolating with a quadratic or with a cubic is quite dangerous. So. Uh, highly not recommended. Do not do that uh, for fitting, especially time trend, but even for other X variables, when you go outside that range of the Xs, it can be very dangerous. Let's have a look at a nice example and an interesting data set, uh, the Boston Marathon winning times. Uh, so this is from early 1900s until very recently. So um, what we see a couple of features here. Um, this is uh, winning times in minutes. Um, so there's a lot of variability here in the early 1900s. We've got a couple of wars. So um, they were running uh, the Boston Marathon on about two and a half, a little bit more than that hour. So uh, three hours maybe. Um, so not the two hour marathon running times that we see now, but quite good times. Um, uh, excellent times. I've run a couple of these, and the, these guys in the early 1900s would run them uh, much faster than me. Um, so there is a bit of variation, high variation at the beginning, uh, up to maybe 1940s, and then past the wars, we see that there's a continuously declining in trend, and it seems to flatten out over the last few years. So clearly, um, a, a non-linear trend here. So what we're going to do is estimate a couple of alternative models. So we're going to fit a linear trend. Um, obviously, we don't expect a linear trend to extrapolate very well here. We're going to fit an exponential trend. So the way you're going to fit an exponential trend is taking log of your y. And that will mean that, oops, go back instead of forwards. So that means that the trend line uh, as is coming down is not going to Continuously, so if I extrapolated, if I fitted a linear trend and I extrapolated forward, at some point I'm going to cut the x-axis, right? So y is going to below is going to be zero, which is completely unrealistic for running times. At least with exponential trend, that will never be zero. It, it's going to asymptote. Um, now, how quickly it asymptotes, how quickly bends, we'll see in the next uh, slide. Um, the third model we're going to look at is putting a couple of knots at 1940 and 1980. So we're going to put a, a knot there and a knot there and see what happens. So let's have a look at this fit. Here's the three different models. Um, the green one is the piecewise linear trend. The blue one is the linear trend. And the orange one is the exponential trend. So um, we can see that the extrapolation of the linear and the exponential is completely unrealistic. We can't have times going like this for the next few years. The piecewise linear trend seems to do a bit of a better job. Um, so there is still decreasing, but they're decreasing at a much flatter rate instead of uh, these two um, down here. If we have a look at the residuals of these, of the piecewise uh, linear trend model, um, we see that you know this at the beginning of the sample the variability and also um, th we're not capturing the autocorrelation well and that is uh, that is um, reflected on our ACF so there's some significant spikes um, hence we th uh, these are generated because of the beginning of the sample we do much better after 1925 or so um, in capturing the dynamics of our time series. Um, so there's some auto correlation left over. We could do better. We could correct for, correct for that, but this will have to do for the moment. 